Ann here from Back Road Buddies and the video we want to share with you today is about a one-year review of our Winnebago Echo. Now we've had our Echo now for a year and seven and a half months of that year have been on the road continuously. So we felt it was about time we would report back to you about how things went. Now this is a rather in-depth review, so we're not only reviewing the Winnebago Echo itself, but how we organized it, mods we've made to it, new gear we brought along with us. So this is really an in-depth review of our whole setup. This is the third of three videos about the review, and it is mainly about the different systems of the Echo. So that includes the propane, the water systems, the electrical systems, drivability, and our overall impressions. The first video covers mainly the interior areas, which include the entry door, the front cab area, the dinette, the kitchen, the bathroom, and the bedroom. The second video covers many of the exterior areas of the Echo. So it includes the heating and air conditioning, the outdoor kitchen, the gear garage, the roof, and the awning. Now since this is a rather long video, feel free to look in the description. There's a timeline for each of the um, sections of this video. We broke it up into areas of the Echo. So look down there if you just want to skip to a particular area or if you just want to you know view some now and then come back to it you can use that timeline to jump right to a particular section. So let's dive in. Part 12 is propane. So the Echo has uh, two propane tanks. Now these are the regular size you know you find at you know Home Depot or the grocery store so you can exchange these tanks when they get empty. Um, we didn't actually do that. We were able to find a place like Harbor Freight and just have it fill. It's cheaper if you can just find a place that'll fill it for you because for one you're only paying for what they actually put in the tank instead of the exchange. Um, now the what runs off the propane is you have the water heater, you have the furnace, you have your propane stove, and then for us we had our black stone griddle when we would connect it up. So our camper van didn't use propane, so we were kind of curious about how much propane we would go through. And at the beginning of the season, it was cold and we were running the furnace every day and we found that we were going through just one of these tanks about every eight days. But then after we weren't running the furnace anymore, uh, we went about three months before we emptied the tank. Now of course that'll depend on how many showers, hot showers you take and how often you do dishes and how often you cook with propane. But that's what we found worked for our lifestyle. Now also with the furnace running it depends on how cold it is. Now we probably weren't really super cold so if you're doing winter camping and it's you know down in the teens or single digits or even below zero you're going to go through a lot more propane because that furnace is going to be running non-stop. Um, but that just kind of gives you an idea of what we went through. Now to monitor actually how much propane we had in each tank we use these uh, Mopeka tank sensors and it just sticks on the bottom of the tank with a magnet and it does a, it seemed to really do well of um, accurately indicating the level of the tank and then you can, and there's an app on your phone that you actually read the readings. Now these sensors have batteries in them and they were starting to get a little low at the end of seven and a half months but they lasted us seven and a half months, so we'll have to replace the batteries in those every season. But that's not too bad, so that, we, that worked out pretty well. Part 13 is the water systems. Now, the Echo water systems consist of the um, on-demand water heater, 
the 50 gallon fresh tank, I think it's 51 gallon gray tank, the 5 gallon cassette um, tank for the toilet, and the water pump. Now the water system provides hot and cold water at the kitchen sink, hot and cold water in the bathroom sink, and of course hot and cold water in the shower. There's hot and cold water in the outdoor kitchen compartment, although we never use that one. And hot and cold water in the water compartment on the other side. Ooh, that's nice and warm in there. Um, now we use this one to like spill things off. So if we had our um, stand up paddle board or our bikes were really dirty. And the Echo came with a little quick connect hose that connected into there. But we actually got a different one so we could actually hook it up to a campground uh, site, campsite water connection, so a regular hose. So this little adapter here, it's cold, my hands are cold. <laughs> so this adapter comes off and then it's just a regular kind of garden hose connection. So then we can use the um, water directly from the campsite instead of um, using water out of our fresh tank. So that kind of saves on our fresh tank usage, unless we have to um, fill it up. Also, it means it bypasses our water pump, so it's less wear and tear on our water pump um, and saves a little electricity that way. Now, the speaking of water pump, there's um, several switches to turn the water pump on and off. So there's one here in in the water compartment there. Um, and these are all kind of what you would think of as three-way switches. So you can turn them on and off from anywhere and it turns the water pump on and off. Now, that being said, it doesn't actually turn the water pump on until you open up one of the faucets. but if you have it off and a faucet gets bumped on, then the water pump will not turn on. And surprisingly, there isn't a switch in the exterior kitchen compartment for the water pump, which seems a little um, strange because they do have, um, there is one on the control panel here, so near the kitchen sink, and then there's one down here. Oops, get that. One down here by the bathroom sink. So almost everywhere you would want to use water, there's a water pump switch. Now we found the water pump switch on this control panel. I mean, you got to click it to bring it up and then turn it on and off. That seemed more of a hassle than just reaching in the bathroom and and hitting that switch in there. So that's the switch we normally used. <laughs> now what's nice about the Echo is all of the water systems, except for the water heater, actually are in heated spaces. So the actual fresh and gray tanks live underneath the beds here, which is kind of why this steps up. Um, and then the water compartment, there's a vent, heated vent into the water compartment as well. So all the water systems while you're camped and have the furnace on are heated. Now this is the water heater here. Now this compartment is not heated but if you have the water heater on and water circulating around everything's going to stay hot and it's not going to freeze in cold weather. The issue is when you're traveling down the road, you've got your heat turned off because you shouldn't have it on because it runs on propane. Propane should be off. The water heater is off. Um, so there are some lines that could freeze in here. So there is a anti-freeze kit that you can install and it goes right 
Um, I don't think we have it in there right now, but it goes in where the filter normally is in here. And it plugs into the electrical here. I don't remember where. Um, and so if you're no, you can leave that antifreeze kit installed there all the time, but you don't have it on all the time. So when you're getting ready to travel down the road and you're, and it's going to be below freezing and you're concerned about it um, freezing, you actually take this, this is a little flu plug, and you insert the flu plug to close off the flu. And then you would go inside to the control panel and there's a setting on the control panel. Now that, what's kind of nice is this flu plug kind of shows through so you realize that you've got it in there. So here's the water heater controls. Let's see if I can get it so you don't get glare on there. Um, so you come over here, it's gonna complain because the water heater is actually off, but there's um, an antifreeze setting. And so you set that and that'll turn on that antifreeze kit and keep it heated in there and circulate the water through. So in essence, it's heating the water via um, electricity instead of propane while you're driving down the road. And then when you get to wherever you're gonna camp, oops, and when you get to camp, you would go out and take that flu plug back out and then set your water heater to either eco or comfort. Now, um, eco is just kind of normal water heater. It just heats up the water um, as you use it. So it'll take a while for that hot water to reach the faucet. But if you put it in comfort mode, then it keeps the water circulating through the line so the water will be instantly hot. Now that'll take more propane, but it means you'll use less water when you're waiting for that water to be hot at the faucet. Um, so we would normally set it to eco, and I think we, yeah, we'd normally do it like eco 120 um, it's going to complain but then if we were going to go take a shower we would we would set it to comfort a few minutes before we're going to take the shower and we would set it to you know somewhere in the 90s which is much lower and then we'd wait a few minutes for that hot water to get through all the lines but then the, the water would be instantly hot at the shower and you wouldn't have to mix it with cold. So you're not wasting any water waiting for it to get hot. And, um, and then you don't have to mix it with any cold so you didn't have to heat the water as hot. Now, I don't, you know, I haven't run the numbers to know if that really saves on propane, but it does make it easier in the shower that you don't have to sit there and try to figure out how to adjust you know, your mix so it's the temperature that you want for your shower. It's easier to kind of figure out what temperature you like in comfort mode and then you can just turn it on full hot in the shower and you're ready to go. And you're not wasting any water down the drain. Now there's two ways to um, get water into the rig. This is the gravity fill. So, you know, you just put a hose in there and that fills up the uh, freshwater tank. And then there's also a city water fill, which you would hook up city water to, which it would be pressurized. So if a campsite provides um, water, you can hook that up to here and it's pressurized. And that bypasses the freshwater tank and just goes directly to your faucets. Um, we only use this once and that was mainly just to test it out. We generally like to do the gravity fill and fill the fresh water tank. That way the fresh water is always 
basically turning over, you might say, um, and remaining fresh. Um, although, you know, there are times where we would add some chlorine every now and then just to make sure it was staying fresh. And if you always uh, fill up your fresh water at the same time that you dump your gray water, since those tanks are about the same size, then you know you aren't overflowing your gray tank because there's only 50 gallons to basically go down in there. Now, the real test for our kind of boondocking experience really was put to the test at the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta where we spent um, eight nights nine days in the RV lot there at the Fiesta where we were parked. We never started up the engine that whole time. So we, and there was no, well, there was a service that came around that would do fresh water fills and gray and black tank dumps, but it was, I think $30 for each. So $30 to fill, $30 to dump one of your tanks. Um, so we managed to make it through that whole thing. We were a little concerned, so we actually bought these, um, I think they're 2.6 gallons or um, 10 liter um, collapsible water containers. We bought four of them. We were going to use two of them for fresh and two of them for gray if we needed to, to get through there. And we forgot to fill them up before we got to Albuquerque, so we actually didn't use them. But we actually went, when we were in the camper van, we had um, like six gallon jerry cans that we used. And we actually did a, I think I had a five gallon collapsible as well. But the five gallons is kind of hard to lug around. And we felt that if you had two, you know, about half of that in each hand, it kind of balances out and it's easier to carry. Now, we didn't actually test that out, but that's the theory. And so not only is this great for kind of increasing your uh, fresh and gray water capacity temporarily, it's also great for those campgrounds where they don't have a, a tank fill station, but they do have like um, water spigots where you can fill up containers. So then you could go over, fill one of these up and and carry it back if you were running low on water. Now to tell how much is actually in your tanks it's on this control panel near the kitchen. Um, so as you can, we're winterized right now so we have nothing in our fresh tank and I mean yeah this isn't always the most accurate but it is usually good enough you know when you were getting low um, and then when the water stopped coming out, you knew you were really low. And it all depends on how level, you know, the rig is. Um, we didn't rely, the gray, oops, the gray tank never seemed to be very accurate. And partway through the season, it actually lost communication with the sensor. So um, that's why this TransWest sticker is here. They're going to try to fix that for us under warranty. Um, but we normally didn't pay that much attention to that gray tank level because we knew if, you know, as long as we paid attention to our fresh and always dumped our gray every time we filled our fresh, we didn't have any concern about overflowing that gray tank. And also, um, we had weighed ourselves on a cat scale when we started the season and we were really close to our weight limit. And in fact, the total weight, we were over a little bit. So we generally didn't even fill all that 50 gallons in our fresh. We usually took it to like 40, 45 gallons at the max um, to make sure we were under our weight. So we knew we were pretty safe with that gray tank. Now the Echo came supposedly with a 10 foot long sewer hose, but no place to store it. The, a lot of RVs store it in the bumper, but the bumper is too small for um, a sewer hose. So we actually installed this um, it's called a super slider and that held our hose. However, when we started out, we quickly realized that the hose that we got, and I don't know if this is typical for all Echoes, was not 10 feet long. It was much shorter than that and we couldn't even reach the, um, the dump at the first campground we were at. So we quickly replaced that hose with a real 10 foot hose, <laughs> which would reach, but the way we had the super slider set up, we had it set up for that smaller hose, so we had to remount this. And we really struggled, because we would have gone with an even longer hose, 
In fact, we originally bought a 15 foot hose, but we couldn't, and the super slider, because it's kind of telescoping, so we could extend the two super slider out long enough, but we couldn't find a place to mount it under the rig that didn't run into something. So 10 foot was even a struggle. We kind of had to angle it in behind the water compartment there to get it to fit, but we did get it to fit. But So I don't know if our Echo, we just got a bad hose, but it definitely was not long enough. Now, part way through the season, we had an issue with the water pump. Well, we couldn't um, turn it off by the switches anymore. And it took us a little bit of Googling and uh, some asking on Facebook groups to figure out what the issue was. And it took us some debugging time. But we determined that the issue was the controller that those switches all feed into um, broke. Luckily it broke so the water pump was always on, which meant that whenever you turned the faucet on you had the water pump working. And I guess if it had broken the opposite where it was always off, you could have bypassed that um, controller. Now the water pump and the controller live in the um, driver's side wardrobe underneath the cabinet here. So here's the water pump and this is the controller down here that broke. Um, so it was really a pretty easy fix and we uh, just ordered the part and got it in. It was a pretty, you know, straightforward replacement and then our water pump switches were working again. And it's nice that it was easy to get to. This is it inside of here that filters the water coming to the cold water on the kitchen sink. Now the one that it comes with is a five micron filter and Keith noticed some off taste in some of the water at some of the campgrounds. So we actually ordered a 0.5 micron filter and put that in there. And we haven't had any off taste since then. Um, we did notice that it did reduce the water flow a bit. So evidently it was doing something. <laughs> now in the water compartment, we had added this get wet organizer. Um, we like it because we have all uh, the stuff we need for filling up the fresh tank and stuff real handy. We keep a, a zero G hose in here and a water filter and um, some other attachments and everything's right here. And we like that. However, this compartment's pretty shallow and we kind of notice that it's a rather tight fit, especially with that hose there that we're concerned it's pushing up against uh, some of these things in the water compartment. So we'll probably try to figure out some changes for next season, but we don't know what those are yet. And this isn't really directly related to water systems, but it's next to the water compartment. There's this light here and it had, this cover had broken off. I think, I don't know if the screws had rusted or what, but we just siliconed it back on. It's probably not the prettiest, but it worked and it held. So that was our fix for that. Part 14, the electrical systems. Now the Winnebago Echo comes with either 320 um, amp hours of lithium batteries, which is one lithium battery, believe it or not, and a generator, or you can opt for two lithium batteries to give you a total of 640 amp hours, which is the way we went. So we have the two batteries, no generator. So in addition to the batteries, there's uh, 455 watts of solar panels on the roof and then a 2000 watt inverter, which for us is underneath the bench seat here. Different models did that differently. Originally they put um, the inverter in the electrical cabinet with the batteries and had the uh, there was a pump up here and they actually swapped those around for our model. And then, um, so there's a solar controller which controls the power coming from the panels into the batteries and a second alternator under the hood to um, do charging of the batteries while, you're, while the engine is running. 
So that means the lithium batteries can be charged several different ways. You can charge them from the solar panels, you can charge them from the alternator from the engine, or you can actually plug into shore power or the campground pedestal or whatever and charge them that way. So what do we need all this power for? So let me just list it here so I don't miss anything. So for us, we use the electrical power for the refrigerator and that's as all other echoes do the microwave the air conditioner the max air roof fan um, the water pump the inside lights and then um, the power awning and let's see that's what comes with the echo and then in addition we have four dc fans that we power um, an induction cooktop, an instant pot, an electric tea kettle, a Bluetooth speaker, uh, essential oil diffuser, our WeBoost cell signal booster, a Verizon hotspot, uh, you know, charging our laptops, our iPad, our two cell phones, an Apple Watch, camera batteries, electric toothbrush, an electric razor, and the motion activated lights, we recharge those. Um, so there was a lot of things that <laughs> use electricity in our rig. Now, since it's only a 2000 watt inverter, if you're running several things that use AC power, you may overload that and it'll kick off. Um, one scenario that that would probably trigger would be running the microwave and the air conditioner at the same time. However, Winnebago has put a switch in there so when the air conditioner is running and you turn on the microwave it automatically switches off the air conditioner and then when the microwave stops running it automatically turns the air conditioner back on. So you know it's it sounds like kind of a you know not a real necessary thing but we found that very handy because there's so many times you just pop something in the microwave and you're like oh oh yeah oh it kicked off for me oh thank you you know because I forgot um, so that was really nice and it just made it really convenient now there's other things that we were a little sometimes a little concerned about would be um, having the instant pot and the induct or the induction cooktop on while we were running the air conditioner so we would plug that directly into the pedestal outside now at the beginning of the season we ran into an issue with using the induction cooktop even when we didn't have the ac running our um, inverter would complain about a low voltage and eventually cut off but that was when we were running this at um, max power for like 10 minutes trying to boil water for pasta and we got some advice from the Facebook group there's a low voltage cutoff setting on the um, inverter this is the inverter control panel and there's several settings in there but there's one called a low voltage cutoff and it was initially set to I think 12.1 well the advice was to lower that to I think it's right now it's set to 10.5 and I think part of that is due to there's some voltage drop between the batteries and where it connects into the inverter so the it reading it's getting is lower than what the batteries actually are so once we lowered that low voltage cutoff we didn't have any issues after that but probably the biggest issue during the season was the recall for the alter the second alternator that Winnebago put in um, there was a it was a safety recall the um, controller in there would overheat it was located inside the engine compartment and possibly catch on fire um, so partway through the season we actually unplugged it we started to hear some funny noises coming under the hood when we turned the engine on and we're like okay we don't want to take the risk so we unplugged it um, initially it took them a while to come out with the fix for it and then there was you know a waiting list to get an appointment to get it done and we had already decided we were going to wait till we got back in the fall to have it done 
So that meant for we didn't have that alternator charging our batteries when we went down the road. Now, at first this wasn't a big issue because we were in hot areas and we were had campgrounds with electrical hookups where we could charge our batteries because we wanted to run the air conditioner. However, we had some uh, campgrounds coming up where we didn't have electrical hookups and we were concerned about keeping our batteries charged and keeping up with our needs. So we actually came across this DC to DC charger that we ordered. We got all the parts. It took us a while to figure out how to connect it up, but it basically connected directly to the chassis battery, which basically meant it was running off of Ford's alternator to charge our batteries. So we got that all installed once we figured out where all the connections were. And that's, um, we actually put the unit right under the dinette here on the wall. It, so it's out of the way, but it's close to a lot of the connections. Um, so that's where we installed that. Um, yeah, so this is the inverter here. And this is the DC to DC charger that we installed. And then it kind of, the wires kind of come into the compartment here. And yeah, trying to figure out where everything went was the tricky part. We also weren't real happy with the solar controller that Winnebago had installed. Many times our batteries were sitting at uh, like 70 percent and the solar controller would be like in float mode and wasn't sending any power from the solar panels to the batteries. And we're like, this isn't very good. We want those those solar panels to top off our batteries every day. So we noticed that the DC to DC charger had a solar controller built into it. So we actually re rerouted <laughs> the solar panels through the DC to DC charger. And so it would control be the controller for the solar panels. And that actually worked out really well. So we were really happy with that. So now we had the DC to DC charger, charging our batteries when we drove down the road, doing a great job charging our batteries from the solar panels. So that really, really met our needs well. So we were really happy with that. And uh, we ended up getting an appointment when we got back to do the recall. And luckily they left our DC to DC charger in place. So we are still using that for our solar um, controller and now we actually have two alternators charging our batteries. So we have the the new recall um, setup coming in and the DC to DC charger so we even have even more power coming into our batteries. So we're really happy with that so far. And the real test again was, of course, that Albuquerque Blue Fiesta. <laughs> Seems to have come up a lot. Um, yeah, because we were sitting there. We did not run the engine, which meant we were not charging via any alternator. Um, and we weren't plugged in, so we couldn't charge that way. So we had to rely on the solar panels to charge our batteries. And we were a little concerned going that long, so... Keith bought a portable uh, solar panel that we could plug in. There is an extra port on the outside of the rig that you can hook in yet another solar panel. So this is the portable solar panel that we bought and it hooks right in. There's a little plug right here. And we plugged it in, tested it out. The only thing we had to do was there's a little adapter to switch the polarity, which we needed for our setup. So other than that, everything seemed to work fine. However, when we were at the Albuquerque Festival, it was bright and sunny most of the days we were there, and we never had to use this. Our batteries never dropped below 75%. They would charge back up during the day and run down a little bit overnight. We use the instant pot for one meal. We use the induction cooktop for another meal. Uh, we um, basically did our normal routines and used electricity like we normally would. Now, 
Granted, we actually ate out a little more than normal at the festival, but um, other than that, we we could have gone basically forever. Now, had it been cloudy and rainy, it might have been a different story. We might have been getting low on our batteries over that period of time. Now, when we plug into a campground pedestal for electricity, we always go through um, this Hughes Hughes watchdog surge protector and that protects our rig against all kinds of um, you know bad voltage high voltage low voltage too much current whatever um, and we believe it actually saved our rig the one night there was a thunderstorm that rolled through and we believe a lightning strike caused a surge in the line Hughes detected it and it shuts everything off for 90 seconds until and waits for everything to settle down and then turn things back on so we were really grateful we had that because and we were in a lot of heat and if we lost our air conditioner we'd have to um, go for a drive <laughs> and find somewhere where we could stay because it was too hot to um, stay out in that heat now one of it was early in the season we were camped at a state park and it was nice and dark out and we were going to bed and I'm laying there in bed and I noticed there's this bright light coming in my bedroom window I'm like who's got a bright light on and I peek out the window and look down and it was the light was coming from here Originally, there's this whole dog face on here, and the whole thing lights up. So it's white when everything's working great, and red turns red when there's an error. But it was just way too much light. So as you can see, we put tape over most of it and just left his eyes shining through. So that was much more palatable for us, especially when you're in the you know out in these remote dark locations. <laughs> you don't want this bright light shining around. So that was our solution to cut down on that light. Part 15, drivability. So both the camper van we had before and the Winnebago Echo are both built on the Ford Transit chassis. Now the Echo being a Class C is a cutaway chassis and it's actually an extended length version of the Transit. So our camper van was only 19 feet long, the Echo is 23 feet long, so it's longer. Plus it's got the dually tires in the back which we didn't have on our camper van and um, we didn't have the eco boost in our camper van like the echo does so we found the echo dro drove much nicer than our camper van even though it's a bigger vehicle it's a little heavier um, it just seemed more stable uh, it's got more power because of the eco boost and it just didn't seem to I think because of the extra weight it didn't seem to get pushed around by the wind as much as our camper van did despite having a much larger profile. Now we did have to pay a little extra attention to the extra length we had on there. Although to be fair when we had the bikes on the back of our camper van we were almost the length, same length as the Echo because those bikes would stick out. So it wasn't that much different. We're taller than we were in our camper van so we have to be careful what those actual numbers are we actually have them posted in the windshield <laughs> next to the driver there so we can look up and go oh am I gonna be able to go under this bridge or not that being said uh, I think there was only two occasions that I remember that our size really limited us on where we went um, Usually we could get into a regular parking spot if we could overhang the back end over the curb or take up, you know, if it's a big parking lot, we just take up two spots just to make sure we have plenty of room. The two occasions where one we had picked out a restaurant and it was in this tiny little strip mall and the parking lot was really tight and we kind of drove through the parking lot and we're like, this is a little too tight for our comfort. We might have been able to do it, but we said, let's move on, and we went somewhere else. 
The second time it was an issue, we were actually driving into Scottsdale, Arizona. We needed to pick up a new laptop at the Apple Store. And it was in one of these, you know, shopping areas where it was really pedestrian friendly, which is what I like. But it looked like the only place to park were in parking garages, which we cannot fit into. And we would have had the same issue in the camper van as well because it was a high roof. Um, and so we ended up, Keith just dropped me off at the curb. I hopped out, went in, and he just kind of drove around searching for a place to park. And even before he had found a good lot, I was done and ready to be picked up. So he just swung by again and picked me up. So, I mean, size can be an issue, but if you just have to be careful. And we should have scoped out the area more ahead of time. Um, you can go in on Google satellite view and kind of look around the area and make sure that you're going to fit okay. Um, but for the most part, usually we can get in. If there's a regular parking lot, we usually can get in. Usually, you know, drive throughs and parking garages are a no-no. Um, although we have seen a couple parking garages that had higher um, higher clearance. So it's not impossible, but as a general rule, parking garage are no. <laughs> Part 16, our overall impressions. So overall, we still love our Echo. Um, all the issues we encountered, we were able to um, fix or work around. Nothing kept us from having to deviate from our seven and a half month trip. So that was a big plus. And all the reasons that we got the Echo in the first place still hold true. The Echo has all the features that we loved about our camper van. It's small and nimble, it's easy to set up and pack up, um, it has high enough roof clearance inside that we can both stand up, we're both six foot, so that's important to us, along with beds that are big enough to fit us. And all the plumbing is inside so we can use the rig year round. So those were all important things from our camper van that were important to us for our new rig. And then the Echo has features that we were missing in our camper van that we were looking for. So the Echo was um, larger in a lot of ways. More storage, larger gas tank, larger fresh tank, gray tank, um, larger fridge. There was uh, room in the bedroom to sit up in bed, which we couldn't do in our camper van. And the bed was closer to the floor, which makes it easier to get in and out. In our camper van, we kind of had it lofted and we had to kind of crawl up in there, which wasn't that big of a deal until I broke my tailbone and then it was very painful. <laughs> so being able to get easily in and out of bed because it's, you know, you either stop your trip or um, you kind of live with the pain if you don't have an easy way to get in and out of bed. It has a gear garage where we can fit our e-bikes inside. That was important to us. Um, there's a separation of space so one person can be in bed either relaxing, taking a nap, or sleeping in in the morning, and the other person can be up and um, eating or whatever, cooking or whatever up front. So we kind of had that more living space to be able to get away from each other. <laughs> it's not like we needed to get away from each other, but, you know, when you're with someone 24-7 for seven and a half months, you know, a little separation of space is nice. Yeah, when we were up in Alaska, we both came down with COVID, and so we had to do a week of isolation in our camper van in this tiny little space. So it got a little old being that close to each other all the time. <laughs> and then the Echo has a real bathroom. We only had um, a sink and a camping toilet in our camper van. So having a shower and a separate sink and a toilet um, is really nice to have. And it doesn't take up that much space inside the rig, so that's really nice. So for our needs and the way we like to travel, we have not seen another rig out there 
that we would be happier with than the Echo. Is it perfect? No, nothing's perfect. Did it not have any issues? Yeah, it had issues, but most rigs do. So we're really happy with our purchase. So hopefully you gain some insight on what the Echo is like and what issues can come up and what it's, you know, really like on the road and whether that helps you, you know, pick a rig that meets your needs or gives you ideas on what to do with your rig or whatever. We hope you gain something out of this long <laughs> review. So thanks for watching. And if you want more details, you can look in the description below for a link to our related blog post. So check that out. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. We'd really appreciate it. Ta-ta for now.